Good morning, everyone. So we are starting our session for today, the non-competitive PG free paper session. And um, we are uh, Dr. Anita Jabba, ma'am, uh, myself, Dr. An John Dave Zakra, and Dr. Uh, Prithvi Chantrakant. Uh, mind you, uh, this is non-competitive, but we will still be marking you and we'll be giving you feedback so that you can uh, you know, go further with these studies, you can know what to do to improve them, how to publish them and all that, okay? So first we have comparison of choroidal thickness in hypertensive patients with healthy individuals using OCT, right? Okay, by Dr. Jamie and Philip. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Today I would like to talk about uh, the comparison of choroidal thickness in hypertensive uh, patients with health healthy individuals using optical coherence tomography. We all know uh, that WHO defined hypertension as a systolic blood pressure more than 140 millimeters of mercury and or a diastolic BP of more than 90 millimeters of mercury. It's unfortunate that more than 46 percentage of the adults, uh, they are unaware of having this condition and many present to us with uh, target organ damage. Hypertension uh, causes ocular abnormalities like choroidopathy, retinopathy, uh, vascular occlusions, and optic neuropathy. Keith Wagner has uh, graded hypertensive retinopathy into four stages. Stage 1 with uh, arterial narrowing, stage 2 with AV nicking changes, stage 3 with uh, heart exterior cotton wool spot hemorrhages, and stage 4 with uh, optic disc swelling. We know that choroid supplies the outer layers of retina and when microvascular injury uh, caused by hypertension affects them, uh, there will be retinopathy and alteration in the choroidal thickness. And by the emergence of optical co coherence tomography, we can uh, detect these changes and the alteration in the uh, choroidal thickness. And since the ocular changes of hypertension precedes the uh, systemic changes, uh, this helps in early detection, management and monitoring of hypertension. We did a prospective descriptive cross-sectional study uh, in uh, the patients coming to retina clinic of our department. The sample size was 31, that means we studied 62 eyes of 31 patients, each in uh, hypertensive and the control group. We included uh, patients of more than or equal, uh, age more than or equal to 18 years and those with clear ocular media and excluded uh, those with diabetes uh, then disease uh, affecting the retina, those with hazy media and glaucoma. After obtaining the written informed consent, we did uh, BP measurement, visual acuity measurement, then uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy, and finally we did an OCT scan on them. We measured the choroidal thickness in three locations, that is subfovially, then 500 micrometers nasal to the fovea, and 500 micrometer temporal to the fovea. And this is how we measure the uh, choroidal, uh, choroidal thickness, uh, that is the perpendicular distance between the hyperreflective outer border of the RP Brooks membrane to uh, the uh, sclerochoroidal interface, and it's uh, done by a single observer. Finally, the data entry was done and analysis was done using the SPSS software. And among the 62 patients we studied, uh, 20 were males and uh, 42 were females, and their mean age was 49.47 uh, plus or minus uh, 9 years. The mean duration of hypertension was 3.67 years, and uh, among the hypertensives, 22 uh, subjects had uh, hypertension for less than or equal to 5 years, and uh, 9 uh, patients had hypertension for more than 5 years. We found that the choroidal thickness in subfovial region uh, was similar in hypertensive and the control group, whereas the nasal and the cho uh, temporal choroidal thickness was significantly reduced in the hypertensive group com uh, compared to the uh, control group. However, the subfovial choroid was thicker than the nasal and the temporal choroid in both the groups. We also found that the SFCT in hypertensives had a weak positive correlation with mean BP and nasal uh, choroidal thickness had a weak negative correlation with the mean BP. These were some um, few uh, studies in the past which had similar results. We had some limitations, that is, uh, we had a relatively small sample size. Uh, the measurement of choroidal thickness, it was done manually and there was no long-term follow-up. We concluded that uh, the subfovial choroidal thickness is similar in both hypertensives and uh, control group. Uh, then the nasal and the temporal choroidal thickness was significantly reduced in hypertensive and the subfovial choroid was thicker in nasal and uh, thicker than nasal and the temporal choroid. Thus the measurement of choroidal thickness by OCT can be used as a non-invasive biomarker to assess the effect of uh, systemic hypertension on the eye. These were our references. Thank you. Okay, so as ma'am was just telling, you finished perfectly on time. So that is also very important when you go for a competitive session. 
and uh, congratulations on this study. Uh, one thing I would like to ask us about the sample size, as you said, it is very small. Uh, but one place you have mentioned 62 eyes of 31 patients, one place you have mentioned 62 patients. So just make sure that you don't uh, consider 62 eyes as 62 patients. Okay, then Make sure those things are always correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you calculate the sample size? Uh, 2 into uh, 4 into uh, standard deviation square divided by d square. Okay, so this is with the help of a statistician and uh, you have got data from previous studies, mm -hmm. found out how much is required to show a significant difference and calculated. Okay. And uh, a good, uh, good study, Jamie. But I think your introduction should be little more to to the uh, topic of your study because you have given a, a broader in, uh, introduction as a hypertensive uh, changes. No, so how to measure? How other you you have told in the limitation that you have used manual method for measuring the thickness. No, mm -hmm. so how were the other studies measured and all? You have to uh, discussion you can include and what is your interpretation? And how you can extrapolate, even though your sample size is small, mm -hmm. how you can extrapolate in the larger population. Mm -hmm. So your introduction, everything you should stick to the uh, study. Mm -hmm. okay. So that sh should be kept in mind. Okay. okay. Good. That was a good study. Thank you. This is good, but then uh, one thing is always have one slide. Of no financial interest and no, no conflict of interest. Whenever you go to a, a competitive session, that is one must because you don't need to have any kind of in, conflict of interest between anything. So, one slide, non, uh, no financial and no conflict of interest. And then, uh, like ma'am said, more about what you are uh, talking about. We don't want to know the whole of hypertensive retinopathy. What, what is your uh, topic and something related to that would be good an introduction and then discussion uh, it, it would be better if you put a table a tabular column on your study comparing with other okay. study what they have done that will give a more uh, clear picture of what is can, can you go back to that slide yeah. the discussion slide yeah so you can actually make this into a proper tabular column mm -hmm. having your study and comparing with what okay. other people have done how much sample size they have taken what mm -hmm. are their methods mm -hmm. and uh, on, and even, uh, I think you could have even uh, correlated choroidal findings with the thickness also in this, this study, isn't it? Mm, yes. Uh, even the hypertensive retinopathy grading could also be made into a small graph, so it would give a better picture mm. on whatever you're talking about. And make sure there are no spelling mistakes. Fourth sentence, I mean, fourth point, temporal, there is a missing P. Okay, ah, so yes. always proofread your presentation and many times if you go through it several times also you'll miss it. You ask somebody else to proofread yours because you look at it with fresh eyes, you'll find more mistakes, can fix that. And like Dr. Prithvi said, discussion is quite an important part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. And once you show your results, you compare with other results and you tell, okay, in my study it came like this, in the other study they showed this. And you can give your uh, hypothesis on why your study is showing a different value, if so. Okay. So that, that will give more value. Uh, like your study was done on this population. So perhaps this population has more of this. Or that study they measured using a different technique. So that shows a different thing. So something like that also would be important to mention. Exactly, because you need to explain what is so different in your study. What is different, so different that... A, a judge should, you know, give you marks based on that. What are, what is the other uh, review studies which you have done and how your thing is different and what something new you are adding to the pool of literature. That carries a lot of marks. And always you think, what is the purpose of this study? What is the impact of this study? After seeing this study, will it change something? So now your study has definitely that, no? You are going to say that this can be used to uh, find out the hypertensive effects. So that is something which you have to stress there. After this study, you are going to say that this is going to be a new method for uh, looking at So you can stress that point. Can you go to this picture where you show the OCT and where you are measuring? 
there you have not shown the measurements okay so if you showed the measurements exact like where it is measured choroidal thickness that would also be nice this was measured using the oct software itself correct yes sir. so you have put 500 microns this side 500 microns that side but you have not shown the measurements okay so that okay. also has to be added okay software no manual measurement means on the oct you draw the lines manually no so that is not uh, see that is not worse than inbuilt measurement inbuilt measurement means it will try to detect the margins by itself that is the only thing it does and that is often wrong okay so manual is better so if you want to stress that our study uses manual measurement so it is better than automated measurements if you want to you can say something like that not really recommended but yeah so you can actually show the measurements here okay this would be image you took yeah this is from your uh, study okay so then you should definitely have the measurements marked there few sample of your data should be there so i think that was a very fruitful discussion yeah so dr jamie uh, you get a certificate of presentation and we hope that you uh, publish the study or you do further work on the study and present it also who is there next okay so next is we call upon dr najla ck from comtrust i suppose i am going to present the paper on study of changes in foveal vascular zone area after glaucoma surgery foveal vascular zone is capillary free zone within macula area of human eye for sharp and accurate central vision it is usually delineated by fluorescent angiography which is invasive and oct angiography is a new non invasive imaging technique recent studies have shown that foveal vascular zone area is enlarged in glaucoma foveal vascular zone area is smaller and peripheral microcirculation is enhanced after glaucoma surgery OCT angiography allows visualization of the retinal and choroidal vascular network by detecting endoluminal blood flow. Aims and objectives were to evaluate changes in foveal vascular zone area following glaucoma surgery, to correlate changes in visit area with IOP, and to correlate changes in visit area with stage of uh, glaucomatous damage. Study design, prospective observation study, study site was tertiary eye center in Kerala. And uh, study population includes 25 eyes of the glaucoma patients undergoing glaucoma surgery. Time frame was from May 20, 2022 to May 2023. Inclusion criteria were primary open angle glaucoma and primary angle closure glaucoma patients undergoing IOP lowering surgery, either trabeculectomy or FACO trabeculectomy. Exclusion criteria includes eyes with significant ocular pathologies that bias the foveal vascular zone area such as diabetic retinopathy, retinal vein occlusion, diabetic maculopathy, macular edema, uveitis, age-related macular degeneration. And coming to methodology, detailed history was taken and anterior and posterior segment examination was done. Intraocular pressure was measured by Goldman Applination Tonometry. Perimetric field evaluation was done by Humphrey Field Analyzer 24-2. And glaucomatous damage is created by Hoda Parish Anderson criteria. And OCT angiography was used to measure the foveal vascular zone area before and three months after IOP lowering surgery. And foveal vascular zone was measured in superficial and deep vascular places manually by two examiners and average of two measurements was taken as final value of uh, FAZ area. And coming to demography of the city population, mean age was 67.2 plus or minus 6.83. And among 25 participants, 32 percentage were female and 68 percentage were male. This pie diagram showing sex distribution and in our study 28 percentage had moderate visual field and 72 percentage had severe visual field grade and uh, comparison of study variables from pre-op to post-op period supervisual vascular process FZ area changed from 0.6 to 0.56 and deep vascular process FZ area changed from 0.59 to 0.52. 
coming to uh, the superficial vascular process and deep vascular process FSA area in severe visual field grade uh, change from uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.57 in uh, superficial vascular process and uh, 0 0.5 to uh, 0.58 to 0.49 in deep vascular process and moderate visual field grade change from 0 0.62 to 0.53 from pre-op to post-op period and uh, deep vascular process change from 0 0.64 to 0.58 and unpaired unpa t-test is used for comparing the moderate and severe visual field grade group for change in FAZ area. Superficial vascular process after glaucoma surgery p-value was 0 0.497 and deep vascular process after glaucoma surgery p-value was 0 0.077. It indicates changes in FAZ area after glaucoma surgery not significantly different in moderate visual field and compared to severe visual field grade. And coming to discussion, the superficial vascular process was uh, significantly uh, FSA area was significantly decreased from pre-op to post-op period and deep vascular process was also uh, significantly decreased from pre-op to post-op period. It, uh, results were consistent with a uh, study by Takuhi Shouji et al. done in Saitama University in Japan. And uh, Yo uh, Young Lopili Park et al. Uh, evaluated microvascular recovery detected using OCT angiography after glaucoma surgery. It was a prospective observation study. And also show a significant degrees in FSA area was observed after surgery in deep vascular layer of macula. And Thun Wang Chang et al. in 2020 uh, shown that increase in mean FSA area in immediate postoperative phase fo followed by gradual reduction and return to baseline sizes after one year. Conclusion, ocular blood flow uh, increases after a significant drop in IOP post glaucoma surgery and glaucoma surgery with IOP reduction improved peripheral microcirculation and FSZ area decreases 3 months postoperatively. And change in FSZ area is not significantly correlated with the visual field grade. Thank you. Can you go back to the uh, two slides prior? Yeah. Uh, so here there is a significant decrease in the FAZ. Can you go back to your... Uh, yeah, so uh, you showed that there is a small decrease in the mean FAZ area. Okay. Uh, so anyway, a very interesting study. And um, also can you go back to your conclusion? Yeah. So you showed that uh, ocular blood flow increases after uh, drop of IOP post glaucoma surgery and improved the peripheral microcirculation and the uh, FAZ areas decrease three months postoperatively. Okay. So anyway, this is a very uh, interesting study and uh, you have looked at both deep and uh, superficial. You can mention that also here mm -hmm. about the deep and superficial. And uh, of course, you have not you have said that it is not significantly correlated with visual field grade. Now go back to the place where you mentioned about uh, significantly decrease. So here um, you have mentioned significantly uh, decrease, but that is not uh, statistically significant, correct? Uh, significant, sir. Uh, P value P was? P value was uh, for superficial vascular process, 0 0.019. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Less than 0.0. Right, right, right. Okay, so you can mention all those things. Very good. Uh, so a very interesting study and uh, this is done with an OCT angiography and uh, uh, you can put the few pictures of the OCT angiography mm -hmm. and the measurements. Mm -hmm. So you said the measurements were done the manually. manually. So that was on the software as uh, the previous uh, mm -hmm. presenter said. So you have the picture and you manually yeah. mark the edges at two examiners and the average was mm -hmm. taken. Yeah, good. So when you mentioned that methodology, you can just show the methodology with the actual pictures there so that Everybody gets an idea of how it is done. Okay. Sir. Okay. Anything to. Good. And uh, Najla, this mm -hmm. uh, when and the marks are uh, put, no, the quality of the slides also counts. In some, uh, you have put uh, black letters in blue. That is difficult to read. Okay. So you have to give uh, importance to all those things. And okay. also your body language also counts. Were you not interested in doing this study? No, <laughs> no, I just asked. <laughs> No financial interest and no conflict of interest. First slide. Mm -hmm. Once you put that, you can actually mention what which machine you have used. Like, what is the OCTA machine you have used here? Uh, SS OCTA. Okay, so you can which company? 
uh, which hidden. mode so you need to actually explain what is your uh, machine and which uh, which mode you took it what is your oct you, should, you can actually show the image and describe how you have taken it that will give the mm. uh, audience a much better understanding of what you have done so that is one thing mm. and then again like what ma'am said you can actually put uh, fonts uh, maybe if you want everybody to see clearly you can use a times new roman that mm. is very standard and uh, at I least i have used it sir ah uh, sorry i have used times new uh, yeah and uh, put a font of a size of at least 12 and mm. only seven only seven sentences in one slide mm. and uh, the color should be such that it should be the contrasting like if you put black you put white for the letters mm. if you putting blue like you put the dark blue then you can put a white inside so that that gives more uh, okay, yeah if you put a bl- same same color contrast then it won't be seen very clearly that is another thing okay sir. and again tab- uh, tableau columns for discussion that would be much easier for people to understand that's it yeah and you can even put uh, you know some graphs or something so that these values when you just look at these values it'll be a little difficult to understand so if you can put a sort of graph there it will make it easier yeah. to understand yeah so just put it you can put it on the same slide mm-hmm. or depending on the space constraint you can just show that so that that becomes clear mm-hmm. and another thing is when there is a study such as this many people will want to replicate the study that is they will want to see okay this is how it was done i also want to try it out so you should give the methodology and like uh, dr prithvi said it would be good to mention the machine also you mention no financial interest you mention the machine you show the pictures of how it was done so that somebody who sees your study will have all the information necessary to do the same thing repeat it and see whether they are getting the same results okay so that is the purpose of scientific studies to do the study and make sure others can also replicate the study and find out if they are getting the same results if not you will have a discussion okay why am i getting this red result why are you getting this result then you will figure out that is how science works mm-hmm. okay so you can mention more about the methodology there okay otherwise a good study a very interesting study more small point in order to save time you need more information mm-hmm. you need to put more information no? in order to save time don't discuss the pie chart and all it is mm-hmm. already uh, evident mm-hmm. no the demography you just tell and mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. is it, this male and female ratio is this don't waste your time describing the charts and mm-hmm. all okay and the sample size calculation also you should uh, do okay so i think mm-hmm. you did you do a sample size calculation yes. for this yeah so you should you should just mention that okay uh, previous studies showed this much was required or uh, similar studies had shown this much was required then uh, based on your study parameters and your um, all the statistical information you have to have this many patients and if you are not able to get that many patients also you should mention that mm-hmm. okay okay in the introduction all should tell why do you want to do the study is any mm-hmm. is there any new concept or anything i don't remember whether you have told in the introduction So next we have Dr. Vishnu Priya Soman. Go ahead, Dr. Vishnu Priya. Hey, warm good morning to one and all. My topic of presentation is analysis of clinical characteristics versus modes of treatment outcome in patients with acute acute committed esodropia. Acute acute committed esodropia is an acute onset esodeviation developing in previously straight eyes. It is a type of non accommodative committed esodropia often associated with diplopia. It can occur in older children, adults and even in elderly. Coming to the relevance of the study, although it was found to be 0.3% only, uh, uh, 0.3% percentage of the total strabismus its incidence is increasing in this modern era of uh, smartphones and visual devices it is divided into five types first one is swan type disrupt because of the disruption of the binocularity second one is the burian franchet type which can have minimal hypermetropia and sometimes associated with the physical or psychological stress third type is the bilchowski type which is seen in patients with moderate myopia convergence spasm and divergence paralysis fourth type is the refractive accommodative type characterized by high hypermetropia that 
can be adequately controlled with the refractive correction. Type 5 is the lesser common variety associated with the posterior cranial fossa tumors. The treatment options are conservative treatment including spectacles and prisms, surgery, volume toxin A injection. The aim of the study is to assess the clinical characteristics, causes, modes of treatment, outcome in patients with acute acute committant isotropia. The study methodology was, it was a hospital based prospective observational study with a sample size of 30 and included the patients presented to the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology at the Thursday Eye Care Hospital in Kerala between the uh, duration of December 2022 to May 2023. The inclusion criteria were age of onset of isotropy after one year, acute onset committant strabismus with the normal ocular movements, photographic evidence of absence of strabismus before the onset of isotropia and the exclusion criteria were history of any eye disease or prior ocular surgeries, amblyopia, history of head trauma, previous history of strabismus, system diseases. The parameters evaluated by best correct visual acuity, anterior segment and posterior segment examination, orthoptic evaluation including the binocular single vision, stereopsis, uh, near and distance deviation measurement, uh, all patients underwent cyclopathy refraction and imaging to rule out the CNS pathology. Patients were followed uh, at uh, first post-operative day, one month and after three months. At three months, inquired about the subjective improvement in the symptoms, change in the angle of deviation, best correct visual acuity, stereopsis and side effects if anywhere noted. The treatment was uh, considered to be successful if the deviation was less than 10 percent dieter. The results of the study was most of the patients were males that is 67 percentage, 46.7 percentage of them were belonged to the age group of 11 and 20 followed by 6 to 10 and 21 to 30 years. Most of the patients were hematropic followed by myopia and hypermetropia. 90 percentage presented with the deviation of eyes. Out of 30 patients, 63 percentage were st uh, students, 17 percentage were preschool children and 17 percentage had office job. 60% used both smartphones and books, 17% used smartphone, laptop and books, 13% used smartphones alone and 10% used uh, smartphones and laptop. In our study, 80% of the acute acute committed isotropia patients were belonged to the Bilchowski group, 17% included variant fancy type and 3% belonged to the neurological type. The treatment given, 33.3% patients were treated with the surgery and botulinum toxin, 26.6% of them were prescribed glasses, 6.6% of them were given and 3% treated with the surgery and Botox. On follow-up at 3 months, out of 30 patients, 29, uh, in 29 patients, the treatment was successful. Coming to the discussion, Chai C. et al. reported the possibility of increased gadget use at close distance results in acute acute committant isotropia. Most of their patients had a history of smartphone or computer use for more than 5 hours per day. Luang Tong et al. found out that the deviation angle and stereo could be re re recovered when treated with botulinum toxin. Our study results were comparable to the study. The conclusions were most of the patients were hematropic followed by myopia and hypermetropia. Botulinum toxin A is a good choice in acute acute committant and isotropia. Excess in ear work can have a role in the development of acute acute comment and isotropia and neurological imaging is mandatory for all those patients. Thank you. A yeah, very interesting study. Uh, firstly, I would like to um, point out, uh, so time well managed, very good. Um, secondly, I would like to point out the color scheme that you have used is a little difficult to read. Just go back a few slides. Yeah, so uh, it's all multicolor, but not only that, if you go a few more slides back, you have green on green sometimes. Okay, so a few more slides back. So this, this sort of color combination is very difficult to read. And also the text, you have written the entire text as a paragraph. Never do that. This is something you will say. And here you see chart title. Yeah, the chart title is a uh, default thing of the uh, thing. So don't don't keep chart title and all that. Make sure you you know, modify the charts to put your title there or remove that completely. And uh, this green on green here and the black on dark blue uh, is not visible. Okay, and all this data which you mentioned, it's what you will be um, saying. Okay, you will look at the chart, you will point at the chart and say 90% uh, percent of the deviation of eyes, this, this, this. So that, if you have presenter view, that would be what you will put in the notes or that is what you will memorize or you will have in your notes. Okay, you will look at it and then you will say this, this, this. You won't put the whole thing there as a paragraph. Okay, uh, so... Either you put that 
or either you put this either the graph or the text you remove the text you put the graph and then you can talk on that always better to have a graph yeah. but don't put it as a paragraph you will have to talk about talk. it to say 90% point to the 90% nice uh, confident uh, talk vishnu priya congratulations mm -hmm. and uh, what about what is the age uh, age uh, age of the patients included all the isotropia patients acute onset isotropia patients above 1 year of age uh, to exclude the um, infantile isotropia and the uh, lo lowest age we got was 4 and uh, older was 27 Yes. 27 27 also will come in yes. the pediatric yes. opd yes, for, because of uh, the squint okay so you have uh, you have included an infant uh, infants photo there that is what i was asking what was the age in in the introduction no one uh, small that, baby's uh, photo um this madam no no second next slide and uh, this madam uh, only to um, the increased phone use so you have not included your patients uh, photos Our, no yes madam here and in the uh, ocular yeah and uh, here okay okay so of, so you uh, found out that 33 percentage ha had to undergo surgery oh. so this is a significant impact no oh. so what is your uh, uh, idea, advice regarding prevention uh, any counseling or anything you are planning Uh, madam um, alm almost all studies um, found out that the uncorrected refractive error is the most common cause of acute acute comedian isotropia but in this study we found out that the emetropic patients were more uh, and, and their phone use and uh, visual devices use were uh, more uh, so it it is uh, like uh, not the uh, uncorrected refractive error the near work is itself the uh, most common risk factor for acute acute comedian isotropia So, what was your sample size? Thirty, madam. Thirty. So, how did you know? How did you fi uh, exactly find out how, what were the how many hours they used and all? Ah, uh, um, there was a table which is uh, showing. You did. You put a questionnaire to the patient. Uh, yes, madam. Yes, madam. With the questionnaire, uh, the mm -hmm. one day is divided into uh, the um, the duration of near work. That is three to less than three hours, three to six hours, six to twelve, like that. And um, also inquired about how many weeks or uh, months. About the patient, mm, if the young uh, and good, uh, the that is all uh, put here, na. Ah, uh, and uh, the the chart. How many the hours of use? Usage. Performance is not included, madam. But the. Uh, But in the other studies, they have told about the hours of usage, na. No? Um. Ah, uh, yes, madam. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the inclusion criteria? wanted to ask if uh, all the cases coming to the opd was taken into mm. consideration acute onset a comitant in, type yeah. of isotropia everybody everybody, everybody. Uh, okay. it's okay. a very rare, rare type with 0.3 percentage <laughs> incidence only mm. but more uh, more uh, towards those who are using smartphones is it uh, from the history yeah. it was uh, okay. like that okay. you can update the title to be little more uh, no i mean it's this is fine this is fine as a title but you can make the title little more appealing by uh, changing something like that mm. you know uh, something about if, if if all of them were due to device use or something mm -hmm. you can mention possible effect of device use or something like that you Maybe. can add to make it more appealing here you have mentioned everything like the methodology whatever you have analyzed you have put in the title mm -hmm. that is also fine same thing methodology should be repeatable so somebody who sees this will be able to mm -hmm. go back and do the same thing same. or you can just mention okay that questionnaire is available on request something like that mm -hmm. yeah if you have a validated questionnaire already existing oh. always go for that you you look for it you might have uh, you might find it other studies would be there international studies 
who might use a validated questionnaire pre validated questionnaire you can use uh, from that from the questionnaire the many studies are using the uh, format like dawers and all from that only i took the yeah so uh, you don't you modify anything modify you use the same thing uh, not modified uh, it the was same uh, thing, but yeah. not about the acute committed isotropia but about the increase of smartphone use and myopia progression uh, like that was the so i think you should mention about that also the questionnaire you should actually display the questionnaire and you know show that it will mo add more value when you say that a validated questionnaire was used this is a validated questionnaire which was used it gives more value to the study okay. so next we have dr rohita Good morning all I am presenting my paper titled Effect of topical corticosteroids and non uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to control post-operative inflammation following uneven uneventful phaco emulsification a retrospective study in tertiary care center in North Kerala uh, So post-operative inflammation after cataract surgery is of paramount concern to for both patients and surgeons topical corticosteroids were commonly used but they can cause increased IOP it can delay the wound healing and can increase risk of infections So key to lack is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor which is available for ophthalmic use given orally intramuscularly or intravenously the analgesic, an analgesic properties is comparable to that of narcotics so when used topically it shows efficacy in treating cystoid macular edema reducing post op inflammation and relieving ocular itching associated with seasonal allergic conjunctivitis but on prolonged use they can cause transient burning stinging conjunctival hyperemia superficial punctate keratitis corneal corneal infiltrates epithelial defects etc So the aim of my study was to compare the efficacy of topical ketolac 0.4% and topical dexamethasone 0.1% to control post op inflammation conjunctival hyperemia corneal edema and changes in intraocular pressure after uneven wolf uneven full phaco emulsification people aged more than 40 years of age uh, with no sex uh, predilection who underwent uneven uneven full phaco emulsification and were willing to comply with post op medications were included in my study and patients with secondary cause of cataract like post in, uh, post inflammation steroid induced traumatic cataract history of intraoperative complications like high fever vitreous loss iritis uveitis history of non sensitivity to the above medications history of topical systemic inhaled steroids within 14 days prior to surgery history of pre existing diseases like glaucoma corneal disease inflammatory eye disease severe dry eye were excluded from my study coming to data collection analysis it was a uh, it was a retrospective observational study and the data was obtained from previous records of 110 patients who underwent uh, uneven full phaco emulsification and who were used topical uh, ketolac and topical dexamethasone between 2020 and 2023 so all patients uh, underwent a thorough ophthalmological examination preoperatively post operative evaluation included uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity conjunctival hyperemia evaluated by slit lamp examination intraocular pressure assessment was by a non conduct tonometry corneal edema and anterior chamber reaction by slit lamp by microscopy follow up examination was done at day 1 1 week and 1 month post op Uh, descriptive statistical tools like mean standard deviation absolute numbers and percentage were used inferential statistical tools like t test and man with the u test were used coming to the result uh, in my first group uh, majority 51.9% patients were between 51 to 60 years of age and 40.7 patients were between 61 to 70 years of age and my steroid group um, 32.1% patients were between 51 to 60 years of age and 51.8% patients were between 61 to 70 years of age a visual acuity preoperatively uh, majority that is 88.9% and 82.1% uh, uh, patients respectively in both the groups were between we having a visual acuity of 636 to 624 at uh, post of one month majority 96.1% patient in my first group and 85.7% patient person patient in my second group had a best correct visual acuity between 69 to 66 coming to intraocular pressure preoperatively 79.6% uh, patients in my first group and 82.1% patients in my second group were having an intraocular pressure between 16 to 20 at post op one month majority 92.6% uh, patients in my first group uh, were having no rise in intraocular pressure whereas 60.7% uh, patient in my steroid group were having a rise in iop so this was statistically significant as dexamethasone group showed uh, more iop spikes conjunctival hyperemia also showed significant improvement after starting the after the initiation of the respective drops but there was no statistical significance between both the groups coming to anterior chamber cells 
uh, at a post of day 7 um, uh, 57.4% patient were having grade 2 cells uh, in my first group and 14.3% patients were having grade 2 cells in my second group uh, this was statistically significant as uh, my uh, steroid group showed more efficacy in controlling anti chamber cells compared to ketula group anti chamber flare and corneal edema also showed significant improvement but there was no statistical significance between both the groups so to conclude uh, ketula 0.4% can be a good alternative to dexamethasone 0.1% in controlling congenital, uh, congenital hyperemia after an uneventful phaco emulsification However, dexamethasone group had a better control of anterior chamber reaction as compared to a ketula group, but it was associ associated with higher IOP spikes. Coming to the limitations of my study, uh, small sample size and was a retrospective study design. These are my references. Thank you. Can you go back? So have you uh, put uh, any other studies which I uh, haven't put the discussions like yeah because that is missing because uh, I don't uh, isn't this study already done the current studies have would have been, been done in this category like lots and lots of studies so this is something where the discussion is very important due to lack of time I <laughs> so uh, basically you need to have a slide on uh, the first slide correct the topic and the presenter name. Second slide, no conflict of interest, no financial interest. Third slide should always be the aim of the study or introduction. Either introduction. If you look at all the slides, there is a lot of text in all the slides. Okay. You should reduce the text on the slide. Since this is a PowerPoint, like uh, Sir said, maximum seven sentences. and. You should not be reading the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You should have this word, word, word. If you want to make it smart art, okay. In PowerPoint, you can make it smart art. Then you put one word, one word followed by the next word, and then link them. And you say postoperative inflammation of cataract surgery. And that is enough. Rest of it, you will say, is quite important, or something like that. You will mention. You just have only those five words there, okay, and. Next step, topical corticosteroids, enough. And then you say topical corticosteroids, so you reduce the text on the page, okay. And uh, the graphs, the graphs are, you know, pushing into the uh, tables. Uh, so all those things you have to uh, change. And there are some, uh, you know, you see the NSAIDs. It would be good if all of them are capitals. NSAID is a... Uh, it's in the full form of this thing, right? So, so you have to put it as capitals. Millimeter mercury, you have to put H as capital. So all those small, small things, they, you know, they uh, create an impression. So make sure those things are also done correctly. And uh, yeah, discussion should be there. Can you just go to the next slide? Yeah, uh, so methodology. Uh, so what is the post-op dosing, Keterolac? A QID. QID. So that was either QID ketrolac or QID dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Okay. You are comparing exactly the same dosage. So uh, ketrolac has some uh, potential corneal side effects. Okay. So any anything you encountered, any corneal epithelial damage or any sloughing or anything? Nothing. Yeah. So all those will come in part of your literature uh, review. If you look ketrolac... Uh, post-op or even cornea you will see that it is not used because it has potential devastating corneal melting side effect also so that is also there and any reason why ketorolac was chosen uh, why nepafenac was chosen or anything like that no uh, uh, before we have already done a study on nepafenac so okay so that also you can compare in the discussion okay so that those are things which everybody would want to know which is better, why Keterolac, why Napafenac, one, was one better than the other. Those things will be important to know. A good study, Rohita, but uh, as everyone is telling, too crowded, too crowded slides. You could have made this, this uh, the male-female ratio, everything you have included, no? In yes. the single... <laughs> in the uh, single uh, graph. And also the tables also. So why did you do a retrospective study? 
you could have done a prospective no yes hmm? so this protocol has been followed in your institute since how long only nsaids in one group and only steroid that is the protocol you are following no yes antibiotic and stero steroids Steroid. for one group and Ant the other antibiotics one antibiotics and kt for the other group kt so you have pulled out the charts where this was given only getrelac uh, given to one group or you have not randomized no you no. have done an uh, yeah retrospective, retrospective study. study so since how long you have been giving only nsaids since 2020 2020 20. onwards, oh. you have uh, you have you are not giving steroids at all oh, yes. to a group of patients yes. to an uneventful uh, clear corneal clear corneal phaco surgery. What is a, any any uh, reason for that? No, we just want to study. So you just no. wanted to study. So you, you no. also said that IOP spikes are there with dexa so Those are the things which you have to say. Uh. Yes, ma'am. Mm. We wanted to avoid. So is there a compl complaints difference because the water what we are af afraid of is the patients are not putting the drops so now, now once daily in epiphenac and all are coming to in improve the complaints so Ketrolac what is the do uh, dosage you have advised uh, QID dosing QID dose QID. Okay. Four. And uh, steroid group? QID. <coughs> QID. 4, 3, 2, 1, you are telling. Yeah. Not the combination? No, ma'am. So antibiotic for how many weeks you are giving? Uh, we are using the combination antibiotics with steroids. Antibiotics, steroids, DEXA, uh, antibiotics, uh, combination you are giving? Yes, ma'am. Uh. Same antibiotic Same, same antibiotic. Same antibiotic for four weeks you are giving? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then any uh, rebound iritis happening to the Ketrolac group alone? No, nothing. We didn't find any patients with rebound. They didn't come back. One patient with uh, K uh, in K uh, KT group, uh, they uh, at post of one week, one month, uh, they presented with uh, grade four cells and hypopion and all. So we stopped and we started that patient with steroids and he improved. Hypopion. hypopion. So you have ruled out end of also. Yes, ma'am. So it was an uh, it, uh, iritis alone. It was, ah, yes, ma'am. Uh, at the first post-op, how was the cell sent patient? At post-op, uh, one week, uh, that uh, person had uh, grade 3 cells and moderate flare. At that point, nobody added steroids? No. Those are very significant. Uh, so, not only significant findings, those are protocols. If a patient presents at one week with severe iritis, will you change the medication? That also becomes part of the protocol because then the patient is switching the group. Hmm. Or whether you will continue with it for one month, no matter what. Those are things which are to be defined in the methodology. Hmm. Or that will be considered as a treatment failure. Nice. You should mention that uh, if these are uh, specific instances where the methodology will be and uh, you would mention that this happened, so this had to be patient had to be changed, so there was a dropout from this study. Mm. Uh, all those have to be mentioned. So, what is the any lubricants you are added to the post op regimen? No, madam. No. Uh, so, say, since you are do, uh, using four times, sometimes ocular surface problems can arise. Any patient complaining of stinging or uh, they, did they stop the medications or anything in your no. sample? Dexa. Yeah, the, depending on the preservative, and if you you back preservative is uh, uh, is uh, good for the penetration. When salconium chloride is not good for your cornea, but it is good for the penetration of the drug. So majority of the NSAIDs use BAK. But that is why uh, we are reducing the dose. The once daily higher uh, concentration preparations are now available. Instead of four times, you can give only once. So that you can improve the complaints as well as the ocular surface toxicity. Anyway, good study. You can continue with this and uh, let us know the result. This is something which can be easily continued. So you have a lot of patients. Your sample size was how much? 110. Yeah. Why only 110? 
because i am sure you have more patients than that who are following this regimen correct mm-hmm. why why did you pick 110 the minimum sample size was 53 in each group so okay uh, okay so don't take the minimum sample size minimum sample size is a minimum requirement okay so if you can if you have more data you get more data you get better results and a more impressive study i am sure you have much more than that no how many approximately you might be having past 2 years uh, your which year uh, post second year yeah so since you joined you are sure that 110 is just a fraction right so by the time you finish your pg you will be continuing this study and you will be pul- publishing the big study on this no this is a pilot study for you now correct is this your thesis no okay so this is your pilot study side study pilot study once you finish your pg you will be collecting data for 3 years or more and you will be publishing the big study right yeah. so now at that point you should remember to uh, make all the uh, the changes according to the suggestions and uh, look at um, Uh, so you are you are putting only ketorolac no there is no other nepafenac uh, no, arm or anything else okay you can consider starting another arm like that and make sure that you take uh, all the patient uh, complications like patient getting iritis all those you you have to note those things okay post up one week how many patients developed grade 3 cells or more grade 2 cells or more those things have to be mentioned and you should have a protocol what will be done if that happens will you add a steroid at that point or will you con- continue on that for three more weeks until patient comes uh, at four weeks at that point patient might come with uh, something which looks like an end of the almatis mm. so uh, hypopyan and uh, all that is very scary for a uh, of the malaria so just make sure that you have a modified protocol to take care of those eventualities and by the time you finish your pg you publish that big study okay up surgeries no like a tract and one month only the follow up no uh, so th- you can include more more patients anyway for one month they will come for the follow up there is no lost follow up in the study no. uh, study so so that you in- in- increase the sample size anyway you are uh, doing a retrospective study and following this protocol since four years i think th- three years uh. no so you can have pull out more charts and do a more impressive study rest of luck